Good morning and welcome to the Salvation Army Church on the Loaf. We're glad that you're joining us this morning to fellowship and worship with us. Immediately following the service today is Corps Cadets, so if you're sticking around, tell Eddie and Kara so they know how to plan for lunch. Next weekend is our Youth Councils weekend. So if you haven't gotten an information packet about Youth Councils, tell me, let me know. I should have emailed them all out. But if you're still missing a Youth Councils information packet, please let me know. Also, some of you might still owe some money. You know who you are, I've already talked to you, so make sure you get that money in this week. Next Sunday is also our next men's prayer breakfast. So be here for 8.30 for some great food and wonderful time of coming before the Lord in prayer together. The week of April 1st through the 5th is Gwinnett County Public Schools spring break. And so as a result, we will not be having any weekday programs that week of spring break, except for our ESL class that will still be going on here at the core. So mark your calendars, take a break, but if you're part of the ESL class, still come on out Wednesdays and Thursdays from six to nine. Men's camp is coming up that first weekend in May, the third through the fifth, but our registration is due April 2nd, that's a Tuesday. So if you're interested in going to men's camp, see Captain Jeremy. If you're interested in helping us out at all, coming alongside in our mission for a one-time opportunity or an ongoing opportunity, feel free to check out volunteermatch.org and that will have all of the times that we need people to come along and join us in fulfilling our mission to reach Gwinnett County for the Lord. Again, we're glad that you're here to worship with us. We hope that this is a time where you feel welcomed and loved and that as you sit among us and worship and fellowship with us, that you'll open your heart to whatever the Lord has to speak with you today. Welcome and let's get ready for worship.
good morning, church family. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning. I hope you're glad to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. I've said this once. I'll say it again. There is nothing like Sunday for me to really be a nice shot in the arm, a nice boost in the arm, if you will, uh, for the week that is about to uh, uh, confront all of us. All of us have issues, concerns, things that are waiting on our desk even tomorrow. But nevertheless, we serve a God who is in control, and we serve a God who gives us this wonderful ability every morning, uh, every Sunday morning, to come here and worship together. And I hope that's uh, nothing that you and I take for granted uh, every Sunday. So, uh, welcome to church. Welcome to a place that it's okay to not be okay. Welcome to a place that offers grace and forgiveness. All of those things that everybody in this room Needs. If you're a first-time visitor, we already hope that you feel welcome uh, and that you uh, just leave here differently uh, than you came. This is a place of worship. Worship is active. There's nothing about just sitting in your seat and enjoying the nice music, hearing the nice words. Worship is engaging. So don't sit back and relax during this service. Engage in what the Holy Spirit may be saying to you this morning. Let's pray as we start this meeting. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for the ability to worship this morning, for the opportunity that all of us have here to gather in your presence, that yes, this is church, but all of us are the church when we leave these four walls, that we can tell the world, the community, our work, wherever we may find ourselves about who you are and the extreme grace and what a privilege it is to be a believer, Lord. And we get to share that uh, testimony with everybody that we encounter. Lord, be with this meeting. We know that uh, you have uh, ordained all of us to be in this room this morning for a specific reason. Uh, so for that, Lord, we are forever grateful and we are humbled. Lord, be with us now as we move on in this meeting. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This meeting is going to be just a little bit different uh, and unique than others in that this uh, we're really going to dig into prayer. There's going to be a lot of prayer uh, in the middle of this and especially towards the end of this. Uh, and if, if you're new to this uh, thing we call church or who Jesus is, this should encourage you uh, because this church puts a lot of emphasis on prayer. We believe that prayer works. We believe that prayer is powerful. And we still believe that prayer is effective for the life of the believer and the non-believer alike. So just to give you that mindset that we are going to be in deep, deep prayer today, uh, and I will guide us along that. So be ready to worship, be ready uh, to speak to the maker today, and we hope that you enjoy this service. We're gonna, I'm going to invite my wife now uh, to come as we sing our first song. I'm going to ask that you engage in singing a song um, to our Heavenly Father this morning. So I'm going to ask that you stand. And as you stand, I'm going to read the first two lines uh, of our song, Come Thou Fount. And it says this, Come Thou Fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. And the last two lines of the song says, Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. And I just... In, um, encourage you this morning to tune your heart to, Lord, to the Lord this morning and to give it to him and let him seal it for you. So let's go ahead and sing. We have an introduction to the band and then Nick will lead us in.
The scripture reading for this morning is from the book of Colossians. And this is Paul's prayer to the church at Colossae. And it is also appropriate for us today. So we'll be reading from the first chapter and from verse 3 through verse 14. Please stand in respect to the word of God as we read. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. The faith and the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this... Sorry about that. It's when you have technology, you need this. <laughs> <laughs> For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed, and conveyed us unto the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God. Yes, sir. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. This is a very special Sunday. It's the Sunday before youth councils. I would like to invite all the youth councils delegates and their leaders to come. Some of the leaders have already gone to do work, but some are here. When I was 12 years old, I knew God had called me to be a Salvation Army officer. But I said, Lord, I don't want that kind of life. 24-7 work? I don't want to be on duty all the time like that. So I just put it off, and when I was 12, that same year, my parents were sent to the Bahamas to be Salvation Army officers. And I'm sorry, to Jamaica, to be Salvation Army officers in the Caribbean. And I only went to one youth councils, and that was when I was 15 after I returned back from Panama. But it was during the time that I was overseas with them, the Lord kept saying, okay, 24-7 is fine. You, with my strength, can do it. So at the youth councils when I was 15, I said, uh, maybe, Lord. And I was still all this time hesitating. Then when I turned uh, 16, I was in watch night service in Kingston Central Jamaica Corps, sitting on 
the front row on the far side, and God said, okay, I need an answer. And it was then I said, yes, Lord, I will be your servant. So I'm saying that to say that in youth councils and in Salvation Army meetings, God calls every one of us to one thing or another. He calls us to local officership, to leadership, to be a doctor, a, n a nurse, whatever he calls us to, we want to rise and answer that calling. I want to pray for all of these delegates. There are 30 that are going all together. Some are not here this morning, but I want to pray for each of them as they go for this special weekend that they will not only hear God's call, but they will rise and respond. Good morning, our precious Heavenly Father. Lord, you alone are worthy of our praise. We are your children created in your image. You gave your life for us so that we could have the hope of eternal life. You are fighting for our souls. We stand amazed in your presence, realizing that you know each of us individually. You were calling each of these youth delegates, calling them to rise and serve you. You were calling them by name. Allie, Julia, Lisette, Stephanie, Emmy, Yosef, Arnold, Hannah, Aubrey, Mason, JP, Carly, Kaylee, Blake, Mitchell, Ava, Brianna, Ron, Sylvia, Grace, Ricky, Mark, Carly, Dana, Tanner, and Peter. You're calling the leaders that will be with them, Sammy, Holly, Captains Jeremy and Chris. You're calling the divisional leaders, Colonels Bill and Deborah. You're calling Captains Matt and Rebecca and each of their staffs. You're calling the territorial leaders, Captain Sarah and Dan. You're calling every person who will be attending from each Salvation Army Church in Georgia to rise and follow you. You have an individual message for each of these, your precious children. We pray that they will fix their eyes on you, Lord, and that their ears will be attuned to hear what you have to say to them individually, and that it will be clear your calling. In your word in the book of Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 14, you tell us, I'll show up and take care of you, as I promised, and bring you back home. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out, plans to take care of you, not to abandon you, plans to give you the future you hope for. When you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. God's decree. I'll turn these things around for you. You can count on it. So we know by those words from your word, Lord, that you have a special weekend planned for each person that will be attending. Life is a struggle, Lord. We're in a battle, fighting against things that separate us from being in your perfect will for our lives. But you've told us the battle is not yours. You are the Lion of Judah, the Lamb that was slain, and you are, the, you are perfect in all of your ways, and you have defeated Satan. Lord, we surrender, not to Satan, but to you. So, Lord, we pray that you will speak to every heart gathered at youth councils this next weekend. We pray that they will say with the songwriters, All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender my life to your glory. I surrender my name for your glory. I surrender my heart for your will. I surrender my dreams to the plans you have for me. Thank you for showing me the emptiness of all I held on to. I surrender it all. I surrender everything to you. Lord, we pray that these words will be in the hearts and the minds of every young person attending youth councils and that they will surrender because it's only when we empty ourselves and allow you full control that we can be useful for you and we can rise in this world in which we live and shine for Jesus. We thank you for all that you've done for us and we pray that you will bless each of these, give them traveling mercies, 
And we pray also that you will speak to the hearts of all the parents or the families that they will come back to. We pray that they will choose to communicate about how God spoke to them over the weekend so that they will be strengthened in their witness. We love you and thank you for all of these things. And Lord, as we accept the offerings of your people this morning, our tithes and offerings, we say again, thank you for your gifts to us, your many gifts that you have given us. And please take a portion of what we have back because it really all belongs to you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, thank you, Nick. This morning we're uh, we're focusing on prayer as a as a body, um, and we pray for uh, God's blessing upon us, and that comes from praying that the the Spirit would fill us with His fire as well. And this old song from the songbook says, "Near Thy cross, a symbol, Master, at Thy feet we fall." Seeking power to send us faster, hear, Lord, while we call. Soul and body consecrating, leaving every sin, longing for a full salvation. Victory we would win. I invite you to stand with us as we sing this, this song. And Jennifer, I know I told you I, I'm going to skip the chorus at the beginning, but I'm, I'm actually going to do that. I'm going to teach you this new chorus to this song, to this old song. This new chorus goes like this. 
we sing, Lord. We send the fire, send the fire, oh Lord. Send the fire, send the fire, oh Lord. To magnify your name, to never be the same. We need your hope. Christ the burning cleansing flame your precious blood but give today we claim look down and see this waiting horse send us some promise holy ghost oh how we long to see another God of Elijah, God of Elijah, hear our spirits cry to make us fit for you to live or die, to burn up every trace of sin, to bring the light and glory in. Oh, let the glorious rest. the 
magnify, to magnify your name, to never be the same. We need your holy flame. Send the our prayer this morning that you would send the fire upon us, that your spirit would indwell us, that would encourage us, that would motivate us to unify, to come together for your purpose, for your kingdom, for your glory, because we love you, and that's what you've created us to do, is to worship you. So Lord, as we, uh, we continue our worship this morning, we just pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that your love would be everything that guides us that motivates us, that directs us. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your presence here this morning. In your name, amen. Have a seat.
without question, one of my favorite songs, Lord, with my all I part, uh, just speaks so true and, and well to us, all of us today. Can you join me and sing that? Just the, vo uh, just the voices. Lord, with my all I part, sir, to thee I'll cling. All earthly things Dear Lord, to thy feet I lay. What's really interesting is Paul got this. Paul understood this. Everything we've talked to up until this point, all of, all of uh, Paul's prayers uh, to the churches, for the churches, uh, about the churches, everything, every interaction, Paul understood to the core, uh, C-O-R-E, of who he was, that Lord, before I can do anything else, I need to completely surrender myself. You and I are no different Lord, in order for you to be Lord of my life, in order for you to have complete reign over my life, in order for me to understand what your will is for my life, and under, in order for me to understand even as small details as what college I go to, who I marry, well, I guess maybe those aren't small, but those life choices too, what we have to understand as followers of Christ or those who are on the verge, maybe new to this whole Jesus idea, is that Jesus has to reign supreme in our lives lives. There's a saying of more of you and less of me, which I agree to an extent, but really, in reality, what it needs to be is, Lord, more of you and none of me. None of me. And all the sermons we've talked about so far, here's my points, and listen to this, in the context of, Lord, with my all I part. First, we talked, to, uh, Paul prayed for the growth of the church. That doesn't happen if we stand in the way. We talked about Christ, that Christ would dwell in the church, that Christ would dwell amongst us. And listen, he doesn't dwell, and remember that word, that Greek word for dwell isn't just hanging around, that's residing permanently. And that he can't reside permanently in our lives if we don't separate everything in our lives that would distract us from a relationship with him. That love would have to be at the center of the church. The fullness of God would be imagined and would be made real in the lives of the believer. That doesn't happen if we say, Lord, with my all I part. I give all of it over to you. And that was his letter to the Ephesians. Then we move on uh, to the, the, the Philippians when he wrote the Philippians. I'm sorry, that first part was, uh, yeah, Ephesus. Then when he wrote to the Philippians, he said that agape love, this whole idea of this unconditional no sense kind of love that doesn't, uh, there's no circumstance that would change it or affect it, that we have to have this agape style love, and that doesn't happen if we are in the way. We moved on uh, to their everyday lives. Paul prayed that in their every ordinary day-to-day -day routine, that what they would encounter on a daily basis, that, it would, uh, that the Lord would reign supreme in their lives. And lastly, their loyalty to Christ. Staying rooted, firmly rooted in who Jesus is. And folks, that does not happen without saying, Lord, with my all I part, my own abilities, my own gifts, my own strengths. And that doesn't mean that God wants to just quail that and just completely squash that and throw a flame on it. But we need to make sure that when we are following Christ, that we give all of our lives. And if God wants to use our talents and abilities, that's fantastic. And many times he will. But let's not predicate that God needs you and I and our gifts. Let's not be that egotistical that God needs Jeremy Mockaby. His strength, his power, who he is, he can work through the heart of anyone in this world, anyone in this community. But again, it doesn't happen until we say, Lord, everything I have is yours. And I get that saying that is very easy, and I can just spew that out. 
and I understand that it's a lot, one of those things that is easier said than done, but in reality, at the root of Christianity, at the root of our faith with Jesus Christ, that must be the first thing. This fear of God and this separation from self that we can allow God to completely take control of our lives. This morning, we're going to talk about his letter to Colossi, Colossians. And what's interesting is he wrote this book, not in the comfort of a Hyatt Regency, not in a Hampton Inn, not anywhere, not in his own home, that Paul wrote this letter while in prison. And you know, he didn't pray for his release. He could have prayed for a lot of things. He could have said, hey, another earthquake would be good right about now. Maybe we can all exit stage left. Like, he didn't pray for that. He didn't pray for his own well-being. I'm sure he wasn't in the best circumstances necessarily. Uh, Maybe there were some physical ailments. He didn't pray for that. He didn't pray for believers. He didn't pray that, oh man, I just wish all these souls would just come to a saving knowledge of who Jesus is. What he prayed for, even in the most distressful time of his life, is he prayed for the church. That should show an emphasis on how much our church needs to pray individually for one another, but collectively as a church, that this church would be a place where God would reside, that God could use us in our abilities, in our gifts, in the resources that we have for the advancement of his kingdom. He prayed for the church. Specifically, he prayed for three things, and we're going to talk about each one of these uh, today. First, that they would recognize the will of God that they would recognize the will of God, what, they, what God wants specifically for that group of people. Secondly, that they would walk worthy of the Lord. That's a tough one. That they would walk worthy. That they would, uh, that they would when people saw them, they would say, there's a believer. There's something different about them. And third, that they would possess the power of God. That they would possess the power of God. Recognize the will of God, walk worthy of the Lord, and possess the power of God. Let's talk about each uh, one of these for just a little bit. First, excuse me, the recognizing the will of God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. If you have your Bibles, you can go there. We'll be camping out there uh, in that first uh, book of Colossians, or the first book of Colossians, the first chapter of Colossians. There's only one book of Colossians. That was a trick for you. Some of you are looking up second Colossians as we speak. It says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you. So this is an interesting, if you didn't watch uh, Emily's uh, uh, support vlog that goes along with all my sermon series, uh, you can still watch it, shame on you, because she did an incredible, incredible job with this. So I would, you can go back on our Facebook page, on our live stream, and you can see all of those things. So watch that. But we learn from that that it says, I, uh, I've been praying for you since the day we heard about you. This is one of the churches that Paul really never visited himself. He didn't start this church in the physical sense. But we haven't stopped praying for you. Uh, and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. To fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul states here that we recognize that God's will in our lives come through wisdom. Biblical, scriptural wisdom. Not our own wisdom. Because if it were up to me, I would live my life on a nice lazy boy watching the Dallas Cowboys or uh, um, another really good team, the Alabama Crimson. Like, I would spend my time on a recliner eating Cheetos watching that if that was the will of my life. I know that sounds really pitiful for a lot of you. But that we don't leave it up to ourselves to determine what that is. We don't, we don't allow our own influences in our life to determine what the will of our life is. But yet we let God, through his wisdom, through the word, through prayer, uh, through... Uh, Uh, support system that we have in this body of believers that we can decipher what God's will is in our life. Paul states here again that we recognize God's will in our lives through wisdom. The Greek definition of wisdom is varied, and this is the definition, the Greek definition of that word. Uh, It's a varied knowledge of things human and divine. It's a a varied knowledge of things human and and divine summed up in the Proverbs. You ever heard that statement that he's all so heavenly good, he's no, what is it? He's so heavenly good, no earthly, yeah, use, something to that effect. And there's some, there's some, there's some, uh, 
truth to that because those people that, listen, they might have a great, if we're going to look at our uh, values here, the upward, they might have the upward thing, and we talked a little bit about this last week, they might have this upward thing down where they understand God and who he is and all of this stuff, but then when you go vertically, there's nothing there. They don't express that love. They understand they themselves are recipients of grace. Then themselves are recipient of mercy. uh, Then themselves are are recipients of all those great things that uh, God gives us all. But in return, they just sit on it. They don't do anything uh, inwardly or outwardly. That it has to be this upward and uh, horizontal kind of aspect in our Christian lives. So that even Paul recognizes, yes, you need to understand and have a deep connection with God. That has to be there. But the other side of that, the human side of it, is that we have to understand who we're talking to, who we're dealing with, uh, what, who we're encountering on a daily basis so that we can be the most effective when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say uh, in the Proverbs, because it says that uh, both human and divine summed up in the Proverbs, and we hear about wisdom uh, in Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 4, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Proverbs 4, verse 6 and 7. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. I like that. If you want wisdom, here's how you, here's how you do it. Get wisdom. So I just tell, tell my, room, uh, my kids, they'll come up to me and say, uh, they'll say, what do I need to do? I say, you need to go clean your room. Well, how do I do that? Step one, clean your room. Like, there's no, it's just very straightforward. Paul's just saying very plainly here, he's saying exactly what it is. You, we need to get wisdom. We need to get wisdom. Get, uh, getting wisdom does not mean in the intellectual sense necessarily. It's not having a doctorate degree from Harvard. I mean, that's not necessarily what he's asking for. Certainly not Auburn because that's just void and no one recommends going to Auburn. Thank you, Ron, for laughing. It's not having a, uh, going to seminary and having a degree in, in, in seminary. It's not, it's not what Paul is referring to. It's not being the most theologically advanced mind possible. That's not what Paul is referring to in wisdom. What Paul is referring to in wisdom is simply having the mind of Christ. Having the mind of Christ. And the only way we can have the mind of Christ is not to pretend and play that we have the mind of Christ, but being deeply rooted in love and being deeply rooted in God's word, the Scripture. How do you decipher day-to-day activities? Through God's word. Is God's word still applicable today for us? 2,000, some out thousand years later? Absolutely. God's word is still alive. It still breathes. It's still effective. It's still ready for all of us to encounter our day-to-day. That is where we get our wisdom from. We have the mindset of Christ by being in deep, deep relationship with with him through prayer and through his word. So it's more than just checking a box coming in on Sunday. It's more than that. You're not going to get wisdom by coming one time a week and hearing God's word presented to you for an hour. It's, it's helpful. I don't want to diminish that. It's helpful. You need that for you. But if that's the only box you're ticking for God's word for the entire week, you're falling short of what God has for you. It's more than praying at meals It's more than just thinking food and getting on with it and not even knowing later on whether you prayed or not. You ever done that? You ever said, did we pray? Maybe shame on us. Maybe prayer needs to be so intimate that we don't forget that we prayed. And I'm guilty of that. Did we pray yet? Did we pray for this food? Like that it's an experience that we can do. But it's more than praying that. It's more than praying before a test. Young people, I know you've been there. I've been there too. Dear Lord, good gracious, I didn't sleep last night, didn't study, help me get an A on this test, right? We've all been there, we've all done that. It's more than that. It's being in God's word so that you can decipher what is good or bad for your life. How do you gain wisdom? Through the word of God, through the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, given by inspiration of God, 
and remember that they only constitute the divine rule of Christian faith and practice. That's how we obtain that wisdom. You and I should ask for this wisdom constantly. James 1.5 says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should what? Ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. You want wisdom? Ask for the wisdom. But be careful with what you pray for as well. Any of you that lacks wisdom, ask for it. God, I don't know how to approach this. My marriage has fallen apart. And maybe you try it on your own. Ask God for wisdom, how to help you through those rocky times. God, I am addicted. I can't stop clicking that website. I can't stop drinking that. I can't stop smoking that. Whatever that is, pray that God's wisdom, pray for God's wisdom to help you. Lord, I just got a bad medical diagnosis. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Lord, I need you to be with me. I need wisdom. I need guidance. I need all of those things that you only you can offer. Wisdom comes from Christ. If you're operating on your own wisdom, some of you are in a world of hurt. I'm in a world of hurt. If we're just going based off your and I's wisdom in all of this, we should seek the wisdom from God. Thomas Jefferson had a great quote that said, Honesty is the first chapter in the book of wisdom. Honesty is the first book, uh, first chapter in the book of wisdom. We have to be real with ourselves. If we're going to be wise, we have to be very honest with ourselves. So that means coming here on Sunday mornings and not acting like everything is hunky-dory in our lives. That's being honest enough to say, Lord, I can't battle this disease on my own. Lord, I can't battle this addiction on my own. Lord, I can't save this marriage on my own. Lord, I can't deal with my son or daughter who is acting absolutely like a fool. Lord, I need your wisdom. It's complete humility in saying that I need to be honest with myself that I can't do this. And it's on those smaller scales, like I just said, with your kids, with your marriage, and it, it rings true for our lives. Lord, I can't do this thing I call life without your wisdom, without your guidance. It's honesty in ourselves that we can, uh, we can truly take in what our fifth doctrine says, where it says that we uh, believe that we are totally depraved. For those of you who are new to church, depraved means I, in my very best, the best possible Jeremy Maccabee in the world is still not good enough to save himself. We're totally depraved. We need someone. We have to have. We are utterly dependent on Jesus Christ in the work that he did on the cross. It's being honest with yourself to walk in this door and uh, to be okay, uh, uh, completely just divulging, whether that be at the altar, whether that be through a close friend of yours here at the church, whether it's my wife and I, someone on the ministry team, it's being honest and saying it's okay to not be okay. You're in the right place if that's you. It's not enough to know Jesus it's putting it into action. It's not enough just to know Jesus. That's a great start. That's got to happen, but it's got to move past that. That's what understanding is. Paul goes on to say, it's wisdom and understanding. It's wisdom and understanding. The understanding, in other words, the Greek word there means basically apply it. You get it. You got the knowledge. Now what are you going to do with it? You know that I'm the savior of sins, what are you going to do with it? You know that I offer you mercy and grace, now what are you going to do with it? For you and I, it's more than just knowing Jesus. That has to happen. That has to be at the root of what we do. But if you just sit on that and do nothing else, we're not getting to the understanding part. It's not enough to know what grace is. We have to put it into action with those who we encounter. It's not enough to know about discipleship and what that entails. It's putting it into action. It's not enough to know what holiness is, this whole idea of clo growing closer and closer to God on a daily basis. It's not, it's not good enough just to know about holiness. It's then the understanding part, applying it to our everyday life. It's not enough to come here every Sunday and sit for an hour. It's not. 
all that is is pew warming. It's putting it into action. You got the wisdom part. You get the wisdom part here. You get the wisdom part in your small groups. You get the wisdom part in the fantastic Bible studies that are offered here. You get the wisdom. Now apply the understanding. Do something with it. That's what Paul's saying. You get it, Colossians. You got the wisdom. You understand it. You got the love. You got the grace. You got the mercy. You've got the forgiveness. Now do something with it, Colossians. Salvation Army Church of Lawrenceville, you have the truth, you have the gospel, you have the Savior, you have the knowledge, you have the wisdom, do something with it. Don't just let it sit in this four walls. Do something with it. Secondly, walking worthy of the Lord, Colossians 1.10 says, And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. And may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God. The King James Version says this, That ye might walk worthy of the Lord and be pleasing unto him. The word walk here literally means to set our lives, all of our lives, the core of who you are, that when we walk everything about you, nothing compartmentalized, no social life, marriage life, work life, church life, all of you as a collective human being, that is what it means when he uh, mentions walk. And the word worthy means to have the weight of or uh, weigh as much as something else. So that verse literally can translate to this, and this is heavy. This is heavy. This, this, when, I, when we were in preparation, when I was doing the work for this, when you break down the Greek translation and put it kind of together with some words, and commentators have done this before, read what this verse says now. Read it with me. So, our walk should weigh as much as the walk of Christ. Stepping on your toes, stepped on mine. Does the walk you live, does your Christian walk have the same weight as that of Jesus Christ. To walk worthy of the Lord. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? Mm -mm. No. But that you and I have this understanding that we are going to, in every aspect, in everything that we do, our relationships with our kids, our spouse, our grandparents, whatever that may be, those at work, our bosses, our people underneath us, wherever we are, we're going to walk worthy of the Lord. Simply stated, we are to live as he did. Holiness. We are to strive to be more and more like him. I don't know about you, but I could use that prayer to help me live this out. I think you could probably do the same thing. Lord, help me walk worthy of who you are every day. Not just Sundays, not Wednesdays. Every day, no matter where I find myself. He goes on to say, uh, bearing fruit, uh, being fruitful, excuse me, being fruitful in every Good work, praying that God would give them the opportunities to be fruitful in their faith journey. Are you fruitful in your faith journey? Is there fruit? You, you throw the seeds, you help, you tell people about Jesus. Is your life considered fruitful? How many lost souls enter our door throughout the year? How many lost doors every day come through those doors? We need to be praying for them. Praying for the lost is important. Okay? Don't hear what I'm not about to say. I don't want to get any emails from what I'm about to say. If you want to know who to send the emails to, Colonel William Mockaby, send all complaints to him. Listen, we need to pray for the lost, but praying for fruit, fruitful Christians is more important. You hear me? Paul understood that. We need to pray for the lost. Don't hear what I'm not saying. It is important. We need to do it. But what is more important, and Paul understood it, and is telling the Colossians, we need to be uh, praying for fruitful Christians, not hypocrites, not lukewarm Christians, 
not those who just come sit on Sunday and leave. We need to pray for fruit-bearing Christians. Christ understood this. Jesus saw the field ready for the harvest, but you know what? He didn't pray for the field. He saw that the field was ready for harvest, but he didn't pray for the field. What did he say? Matthew 9, 38. Excuse me. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors. Send forth labors into the harvest. Let me understand. Let me share a little bit why it's important to pray for fruitful Christians. It's very important. If we have fruitful Bearing, fruit bearing Christians, if we have people walking worthy of the Lord who are submitting to God's will in their life, this, this whole idea of Lord with my all I part that are set apart, that we have these real Christians on fire, passionate believers in Jesus Christ, man, trust me, the field is nothing. That will, that will just grow more than we possibly can imagine. But it doesn't happen with lukewarm, cold believers. That field is plucked, that field is gathered by the work of on-fire, passionate, soul-winning, on-fire-for-Jesus believers. Pray for the lost, pray for them, but pray for fruitful believers who love Jesus Christ. Not pew warmers, not warm bodies, not stagnant believers, not lukewarm believers, we have enough of those. We need fruitful, on fire, engaging, passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Paul understood that. Close with this, that we possess the power of God. Colossians 1.11, being strengthened with all power, with all power from God, according to his glory, uh, his Glorious might, uh, I'm sorry, let me read it from here. Being strengthened with all the power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Paul prayed that they would be strengthened with the power of God, not their own power. A lot of these guys probably did have really great gifts, talents, abilities, all that's great, but they need the power of God. Some of you in here, man, you are talented. Some of you have more talent in your pinky finger, Josh, Nick, I mean, you guys have more talent in your pinky finger than it resides in my entire body. And all that is great. But even those most talented, even those that we can put up on a pedestal, let's say the Billy Grahams of the world, as great and wonderful and amazing as they are, they'll be the first people to tell you, I don't operate in my own strength, I operate in the power of Jesus Christ. You and I, we're no different from Billy Graham. There's nothing better that Billy Graham does that makes us better than us. You and I have the right and ability to be Billy Grahams. How do we do that? By understanding the will of God in our life. We do it by allowing him to empower us, him to give us strength, him to give us courage. Remember, God is, uh, has the power over the physical world. He cured, uh, he, he, he calmed the seas. He, God has pure... Uh, power over the spiritual war. He cast out demons. God has power over the, uh, of life and death. He raised people from the dead. Why wouldn't you want that power? The church during this time did not need those operating under their own power. Those churches fall apart. We in this church do not need people operating our own power. We need fruit-bearing on fire, passionate lovers of Jesus Christ. We need to operate in his power because if we don't, we'll fail. Let me ask you a question. This is kind of a different way of showing this. Let me, let me ask you a question. If we're speaking of power, let's say you're going on a trip to uh, California. Which one of these on the screen would you uh, choose to take? First, we have uh, a bike, is that right? Yes, the bike. There it is. There's the bike. Would you choose the bike? That looks like my mother-in-law. It really does. Don't tell her I said that. She's not watching, is she? Love you, Diane. Uh, or would you use the bike or would you use a car? How many of you had a station wagon growing up? Absolutely. 
Or if I can do a little self-plug in here, how many of you would take the, go ahead, Delta Jet? There you go. What are you going to choose? Come on. Plane. You're, none of those. None of you are leaving. You're a warm body. You're staying home. Like if we're talking strictly on a power sense, there's no question that we are going to take the plane. There's no question. It would be silly of us if we're going off a power thing, strictly power-based, uh, which one that we would take. We would certainly take the power of that 777 airplane. Great airplane, by the way. Ask me about it sometime. How about this one? Well, let's go to the next one. If I were to ask you uh, to pick someone to win a, uh, win a swimming meet, so you're going you're gonna to pick someone to, to swim, and you, you want, you're going to throw all that you have in uh, to this. You want uh, the power speaking. Wh- who are you going to choose? You got Maverick. Yeah, good one. Secondly, you got me. That might be the obvious choice, but wait. Or you got Mr. Michael Phelps. I don't want letters about the email. Yes, his shirt's off. Okay, let's go over. <laughs> who are you choosing? Phelps, it's the obvious choice, right? It's obvious. Out of the three of those, I know it's a close between me and Michael, but out of the three of those, the, Michael Phelps certainly has the most power of all of those. One more. How about this one? If you want to win a championship, if you want to win a national championship, are you going to choose Auburn? Are you going to choose Florida? Or are you going to choose Alabama Crimson Tide? I don't need you to speak here. That's a rhetorical question. (laughs) So listen, here's what I'm getting at. All that to say, uh, all joking aside, here's what I'm getting at. The obvious choices, the plain, Michael Phelps, they're obvious things that we are going to choose when it relates to power. If we see God's power alive and well, if we see the power, what the Holy Spirit can do, he can bring uh, back people from the dead. He can tell waves, he can tell seas to stop it. He can tell demon possessed men, he can tell the demons to get out. If we see that power and we hear about that power, if we have that wisdom of understanding those things, then we can't help but to allow Jesus to be the power of our lives. It's got to be as obvious as those things that we just put up there. But a lot of times, if I said, here's a picture of Jeremy, here's a picture of Jesus Christ, who are you going to go with? And a lot of times, in my life, I'll say, God's good. He loves me. But I think I know best. I think I can operate in my own power. And I don't think I would be far stretched by saying, you have done the same thing. But we got to get to a point in our lives when we say, Lord, with my all our part, and we separate from who we are. And we can be very honest. We can be very truthful with the wisdom that we gather through God's word and through prayer. That the obvious choice that we have to operate in the strength of is God himself. It's got to be as obvious as those pictures were. It has to be. The minute you start wavering, well, God's good, but I think I might know best. That's when we get ourselves into trouble. This morning, I'm going to lead you in a, in a little unique prayer time. And, and, and for some of you, this may be uncomfortable. I can ask you to like, pray with the person next to you. I want you to pray for these specific things. I want to pray first that we would recognize the will of God in our life. To recognize the will of God in your life. Remember, yes, this is the church, but if we accept that through wisdom and understanding, we also understand that we are the church, that the church resides in us. So we need to recognize the will of God in our lives. So the altars are going to be open. If you want to pray through this while I step walk you through this, please, by all means, come to the altar, come kneel and get that wisdom, ask for that wisdom, do all that, come to the altar, maybe someone will pray with you there. If you want time alone, just you and God, come kneel at the holiness table here, come kneel at this table, and no one will bother you there. But as I walk you through this, there's just going to be some nice music going underneath, nice music going underneath, and I want you to specifically pray for first, to recognize the will of God, that 
you would recognize that it would be obvious in your life what God's will is for your life. That might be a doctor, nurse, officer, pilot, whatever that is. Whatever that is. God doesn't just call pastors. He calls everyone to do something unique in your own life. So while we're praying for that, there's going to be some music going on, and you can stay where you are, or you can come to the altar, and there's going to be some scripture verses. If you just need some help from a scripture standpoint, from God's word, that are just going to be rotating during this time. If you just want to open your eyes and read some of the things that go along with each topic that we're talking about, use this time wisely. Come and kneel at the altar, pray in your seats, whatever that is. If you want to go grab someone and you want to pray for them, you want to pr- Pray that they would recognize or that they would help you recognize, whatever that looks like. Use this time to pray, to meditate. So the music's going to begin. And as we do, respond. Respond in some way. Use the scriptures. They're going to be going. And then I'll walk us through the next step. But would you use this time to pray?
continue praying for the will of God in your life if you still need to continue with that. Secondly, we talked about that we would walk worthy of the Lord. That we would walk worthy of the Lord and the weight that that can carry but is expected of us. Would you take a few minutes as the music plays? Again, scripture will be on the screen if you need some help from the scripture standpoint. But would you pray now specifically that you would walk worthy of the Lord? Would you pray that you would possess the power of God? That you would not operate in your own power, in your own strength, your own ability. That you would let God be the source of that power in your life. Because the default position as human beings is to operate in our own knowledge and our own understanding. But would you pray specifically that we would possess the power of God?
all of these things we discussed this morning start by saying, Lord, with my all, I part. Lord, with my all, I part. Thank you, Captain. Prayer gently lifts me to highest heaven. Sweet hour of prayer. Hasn't it been awesome to just sit and be aware of the unseen presence, but not unfelt? God is here. God is near. God wants to bless us today. And we thank him for that opportunity. We're going to sing our closing song. It's uh, probably a song that's not real familiar to most of us. It isn't in the songbook. I always say, if it's not in the songbook, I don't know it. <laughs> but I have learned a lot of beautiful worship songs. And we're going to sing this song, Church Arise. I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm going to ask you to not follow me, but follow Josh. He's really going to be the leader of this song, and we're going to sing along with him this morning, and it's called, Oh Church, Arise. Oh Church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. An army bold, whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. The second verse are called a word.
Hi, I'm Captain Jeremy Mockaby, pastor of the Salvation Army Church on the Lobe. Thank you so much for downloading or streaming this service on your device. We hope that it was a blessing to you, uh, maybe something that was said today, uh, sung today, or the message. We just hope that the Spirit uh, was allowed to move in your life uh, and that you uh, are a different person because of what you experienced today. If you have any questions or if you just want some follow-up, we would love for you to contact us. My information will be below, and we would love to be in touch with you and to hear what God is doing in your life. Again, thank you and God bless you.